In the mid-19th century, an era of broad artistic change, a literary movement sprang up in France stimulated by the works of novelist Émile Zola. It was called naturalism, and it was an attempt to look at the world with a cold, objective eye, watching human beings act within the society around them. Naturalistic works emphasized the dark side of human life, the harshness of it, and in 19th century France, particularly among the so-called lower social classes, there was much to report that was violent, deadly, and pessimistic. There was an Italian version of naturalism, something that we call verismo, or realism. It affected the literature, the theater, and the opera of Italy in the late 19th century and caused a real storm of criticism from the more traditional members of the opera audience. But the excitement of the new language was something that audiences couldn't resist for long. Soon, they were demanding these more realistic stories in opera and begging to see more works that dealt with real people in real situations, particularly in the small towns and villages of southern Italy where life was hard. Villages, by the way, that closely resemble our location today, the Leo Carrillo Ranch. That brings us to the topic at hand. There are two Verismo operas that perfectly reflect this Italian style, so much so that for nearly a century they've been paired together as a full evening of entertainment. One was composed at the behest of a music publisher who opened a competition asking for short, one-act operas for the stage. The other was composed as a hopeful reaction to the overwhelming success of that first opera. The operas are Cavalleria Rusticana by Pietro Mascagni and Pagliacci by Ruggero Leon Cavallo. I'm Nick Ravellis, and this is Opera Talk. Pietro Mascagni was a relatively young man of 27 when his greatest success, Cavalleria Rusticana, premiered at the Teatro Costanzi in Rome. Mascagni came from humble origins. With help from a local nobleman in Livorno, his hometown, he went to the Milan Conservatory when he was a student and a roommate living the bohemian student life with none other than Giacomo Puccini. But he didn't last long at the conservatory. His spirit really rebelled against any kind of formal or structured compositional training. And in 1885, he left Milan and began to tour with various small opera companies, acting both as a kind of resident composer and arranger, as well as a conductor. He finally landed in Cerignola in the region of Apulia in 1886, making his living as a music teacher. Now the plot thickens, but I have to back up for just a moment. Certainly, the most important music publishing house in Italy was the House of Ricordi. But there was another music publishing house that had control of the more minor Italian composers and who gave Ricordi a real run for their money. That was the publishing firm of Sonzogno. It was founded in Milan a little bit earlier than Ricordi, but only began to specialize in music publishing in 1874. In 1883, the grandson of the founder of the firm, one Eduardo Sonzogno, instituted the opera competition. The Sonzogno competition was a great prize for a young composer because it came not only with publication, but with an assured production of the work. In 1889, the young Mascagni felt that he was ready to enter the competition and put everything aside in order to prepare an opera for it. There were 72 other applicants. For inspiration, Mascagni turned to the work of Giovanni Verga, one of the Italian proponents of that literary naturalism that I spoke of earlier, Verismo. His short story, Cavalleria Rusticana, or Rustic Chivalry, was based on an actual event that took place in the Sicilian countryside and was so powerful that the great 19th century actress Eleonora Duza asked him to dramatize it so that she could play the principal female role. Mascagni saw the play with Duza in Milan in 1884, but didn't consider it as fodder for an opera libretto until he finally decided to enter the Sonzogno competition. Well, he won. The work received its premiere at the Teatro Costanzi in Rome in 1890, and it was a runaway hit. Within just a few months, it was performed in every European capital and began making its way through North and South America a scant year later. Mascagni never had another success like 
Cavalleria Rusticana. It's Easter Sunday morning and Turidu, a young peasant, sings of his love for Lolo, the wife of one of the other villagers named Alfio. But coming out of the village church is Santuzza, the woman that Turidu had loved before falling under the spell of Lolo. She begs him to come back to her, then threatens him finally with the curse, Mala Pasqua, then runs to tell Alfio of Turidu and Lola's forbidden love. After the Easter service spills into the village square, Alfio confronts Turidu, and in the ensuing duel, the young man is killed. Ruggiero Leoncavallo was born to a magistrate in Naples and had a relatively well-off childhood. He attended the Naples Conservatory where he excelled in piano and composition and later continued his work at the Bologna University, the oldest university in Europe. Leon Cavallo's first break came with the overwhelming success of Mascagni's Cavalleria Rusticana in 1890, an event which spurred his interest in writing a similar short opera with a realistic and violent story at its core. He chose to write about something that actually happened in a town close to Naples when he was a child an on-stage murder of a wife by her jealous actor husband. The case was brought before his magistrate father, from whom he undoubtedly received the story. Although he had an earlier relationship with the House of Ricordi, Leon Cavallo offered his idea to Sonzogno, who grabbed it up enthusiastically, convinced that it would be as successful as Cavalleria had been. And in fact, that is exactly what happened. At the premiere in Milan's Teatro Al Verme, Pagliacci was wildly successful, due in no small part to the baton of the relatively new conductor, Arturo Toscanini. A traveling group of actors arrives in a small Calabrian village ready to perform. Their leader is Canio, the clown named Pagliaccio in the troupe. Canio is married to Nedda, to whom the hunchback actor Tonio is very attracted. When Tonio tries to kiss her, she turns on him, and for this, Tonio will seek revenge. Nedda is actually in love with another member of the troupe, Silvio, and while they sing a love duet, Tonio fetches her husband Canio to catch the two lovers in the act, but Canio is too late. He knows that his wife has a lover, but he doesn't yet know who. In his famous aria, Vesti la Giubba, he bemoans his fate as the cuckolded husband. The second act is, in fact, the troupe's performance, and it exactly mirrors the real-life situation. Arlecchino makes love to Colombina, played by Nedda, but when Canio, the Pagliaccio, arrives, his jealousy overcomes him. Canio, in a fit of rage, stabs Neda to death, as well as Silvio, who runs up onto the stage in order to help her. The opera ends with Canio's famous words, La Commedia è finita, the drama is ended. My guest to discuss Cavalleria and Pagliacci is my good friend, Dr. Ron Jaheen, professor of music at the University of San Diego. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome back, actually. <laughs> it's good to have you here again. Um, let's talk a little bit about Verismo. I, I mentioned it briefly at the beginning of the, uh, of the show, but I wonder if you could take us down that path just a little bit, talk about what operatic Verismo is really all about and how it affected opera and the art form in the late 19th century and going into the 20th. Okay, uh, the elements of Verismo as it was expounded by the literature, by the writers, was the focus on the lower classes. And in literature, it was more of the language that could express the sentiments that was uh, typical of people living in the lower classes in southern Italy. So you mean by language, it was a more 
what, a, a baser form of, yes. of the language? Yes, it reflected the reality, you know, realism right. of the people of Southern Italy. And of course, any of us who have traveled to Southern Italy or Sicily realize that the language is very different. Very, yes, in very, those, very in those parts different. Of, the, of Italy. Yeah. Very different. Uh, the other element, too, of uh, literary realism, and this was picked up by Verga, was uh, the objectivity. Mm -hmm. There was no artistic uh, expression, there was no commentary on it. It was just at painting life as it was. But don't you think, like, well, Verga certainly in Italy, but also Emile Zola, maybe Flaubert in France, that they were being objective with the purpose of turning a light onto this lifestyle for the rest of society to realize how devastating poverty could be yes. for these folks yes, in, in rustic areas. Absolutely, but they didn't, in, they didn't uh, bring in their own viewpoint. They didn't make they judgments. Just, right, yeah. they just framed it and let you see it as it was. So that was the literary element of uh, realism that turned into verismo. When it came to opera, the first problem was when they wrote a libretto, the language, the original language was not the same because they had to write it in the elevated, elevated language of an Italian libretto. So that was the first removal from it. The second, of course, was uh, the realistic portrayal of life in southern Italy, which was done very successfully in Cavalleria Rusticana and in Pagliacci. But for the other operas that were in and around it and came after it, they weren't as successful. It seems that those two operas represented the beginning and the end of mm. Italian operatic verismo. Uh, the problem is there are so many threads, musical threads going on in opera in the 1890s and on, that composers picked and chose what they wanted to incorporate into their operas. If you want to talk about things that happened right around Pagliacci uh, and Cavalleria, there was an opera by uh, Giordano called Malavita, there was an opera by Chilea called La Tilda, and these were operas that dealt with prostitutes and love triangles, much as in mm. Cavalleria and Pagliacci, but they weren't as successful. And plus the music wasn't as good in those, yeah. in those operas, so they didn't survive. That's interesting. You know, it's, it's also interesting that the so-called Verismo composers, besides Mascagni mm. and uh, Leon Cavallo, you have Montemezzi, mm -hmm. who wrote uh, L'Amore de Tre Re, mm -hmm. uh, Giordano, Andrea Chenier. And Andrea Chenier, Chilea with Adriana Le Couvreur. Mm -hmm. They La all, Lisiana. yeah, they were all one-hit wonders. Yes. in a sense. I mean, uh, there, there's one opera of each of these mm -hmm. Verismo composers that mm -hmm. that we know, sort of. Yes. They're not all that performed much anymore, uh, and that was it. Yeah. Well, the problem with the operas that you mentioned, for example, Andrea Chenier. That's not really a Verismo opera, although many writers will say that it is. Mm -hmm. It has sensational elements, but sensationalism, we don't know whether that's a, an exact outsprout of Verismo or if it was just the you know, fin de siècle, decadent kind of approach where the effect was the most important thing. And that's the same thing for, the best example, I guess, is Tosca in the second act. I mean, we've argued about whether it's a Verismo opera and many... Or Moscow whether Puccini Carno. was a true Verismo composer. E exactly. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ron. I appreciate your being You're welcome, here. Nick. Thank you very much. Let's look at Cavalleria first. When you look at the opera analytically, it's a series of set pieces or numbers, one after another. Remember, it all takes place during a Sicilian Easter celebration, within one day's time in a rustic little village. So first we have a prelude played by the orchestra. This is interrupted by a romanza sung by Turidu from offstage, singing a serenade to his new girlfriend, his beloved Lola. We 
return to the prelude and then immediately into a village scene introduced by church bells and it accompanies the villagers coming out of the church on Easter Sunday morning. Then there's a short scene with Santuzza asking Mamma Lucia where her son Turidu is. Because Santuzza is Turidu's former lover, Mamma Lucia doesn't really want to have anything to do with her, doesn't want any trouble. But the trouble is to come, and it's predicted by a kind of fate theme in the orchestra. It's one short vignette after another until we have the great confrontation between these former lovers, Turidu and Santuzza, which is a wonderful duet and is truly the heart of the opera. There's little or no sharing of melodic ideas from one vignette to another, no development of themes. In a way, Mascagni's approach to the music is simple and very direct, much like the life of these Sicilian villagers. There is one soaring tune, of course, in the intermezzo that you're not likely to forget, and that's one of the crowning moments of the opera. Now, Leon Cavallo approaches his opera, Pagliacci, in a completely different way. It's much more influenced by the late operas of Verdi, especially Otello and Falstaff, in which the composer approaches opera not so much in terms of individual numbers, but as an ever-dynamic, ever-developing whole. There's no better way to show this than to take one of the themes, and one only, from Pagliacci and show you how Leon Cavallo develops it. It shows up first in the opening prologue. And the prologue is exactly that, a text sung by the baritone who plays the role of Tonio, a text that sets us up as an audience to witness this tragedy that's about to ensue. When he sings about how we're going to see two human beings love each other, we get a variant of that tune that we heard earlier. The tune returns when Nedda, the love interest in the opera, first enters. She's worried that her husband Canio is suspicious of her and that he might discover her secret love of Silvio.
The same tune gets a real workout in Sylvia and Neda's duet. At this point of the duet, we hear hints of that same tune in the accompaniment, followed by a statement of the tune in the lower instruments of the orchestra. And here's a transition statement of the tune where Leon Cavallo extends it to provide an introduction to a whole new section. That new section is based on the same melody, but it's kind of turned in on itself and is almost unrecognizable. This kind of technique, where a composer takes a melody and continually develops it to become a part of the fabric of the whole piece, is not something that came naturally to Mascagni, and so it has very little part to play in Cavalleria Rusticana. But it's the essential manner in which these two operas are different, yet both works still proudly carry the banner of Italian Verismo style. That's because the elements of Verismo are not so much about the style of the music, as they are about the style of the librettos, the stories of the operas, popular, full-blooded, passionate works about people living a hand-to-mouth existence at the lower levels of society. Okay, let's get right into it. How can you go wrong with a recording of Cavalleria Rusticana with the composer himself, Pietro Mascagni, at the helm? And what a cast. Benjamino Gilli as Turiddu, Lina Bruna Rasa as Santuzza, a young Giulietta Simeonata as Mamma Lucia, with the La Scala Chorus and Orchestra recorded in 1940. But beware, these are the slowest tempos on record. And he, the composer, sometimes completely ignores the markings that he put in his own music. But as a historical documentation of a significant work by the composer himself, you can't go wrong. And the CD transfer on Maxos is excellent. Here's a 1953 recording with Yussi Bierling, Zinka Milanoff, and Robert Merrill in the cast, conducted by Renato Cellini on RCA. A lot of people swear by this version because of the tenor's brilliant performance as Turiddu. It's a mono recording, but historically significant. Here's a performance with which you cannot possibly go wrong, conducted by Herbert von Karajan with Carlo Bergonzi, Fiorenza Cossotto as Santuzza, and Adriana Martino as Lucia. You might wonder about the use of a mezzo, Cossotto, in the role of Santuzza, but it works beautifully, and this recording is often considered one of the most perfect recordings of any opera. More contemporary is this recording with Placido Domingo, Renata Scato, Isola Jones, and Pablo Elvira from 1978, conducted by James Levine. The National Philharmonic, a London orchestra, provides a beautiful, lush sound. 
If you want both operas in a double CD, here is Cavalleria with Mario del Monaco and Giulietta Simeonato under the direction of Tullio Serafin, with Pagliacci, again with Del Monaco, Gabriel Latucci, and Cornell McNeil under the direction of Molinari Pradelli. This is a great bargain, and the performances are idiomatic, dramatic, and intense. Let's continue now with Pagliacci recordings with another historical recording with UC Bierling. Victoria de Los Angeles, Robert Merrill, and Leonard Warren all round out the cast on EMI. Although its old mono sound is a bit dry, it's been well remastered and the performance is fantastic. Bierling is, of course, superb. Again, Herbert von Karajan has an excellent entry with Carlo Bergonzi, Joan Carlyle, Giuseppe Taddei, and Rolando Panerai with the La Scala Orchestra and Chorus. Many listeners swear by this recording because everyone is splendid in it, an absolutely amazing cast. And one last entry with Domingo Caballé and Cheryl Mills on RCA, Nello Santi conducting the London Symphony Orchestra. On DVD, we have fewer choices. There is this interesting item, actually a film of both of the operas, with Domingo in the tenor roles of Turidu and Canio, directed by Franco Zeffirelli and conducted by Georges Pret. This is a great way to get to know the operas, but it's not a staged version, so know what you're buying before you get it. For a good standard widescreen surround sound version of Pagliacci, we have this DVD with Roberto Alagna as Canio and Svetla Vasileva as Neda from the Arena di Verona. What a wealth of riches we have for these two operas. Good luck choosing your favorites. Remember that Italian word verismo, realism. It describes a very definite style of literature, theater, and opera that was popular at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries. In opera, verismo itself was short-lived, but it certainly made an impact on works created by composers who followed in the footsteps of Leon Cavallo and Mascagni. The formula for these works involved intense, tragic stories about people living at the lowest levels of society, but always accompanied by music of searing beauty and passion. See Cavalleria Rusticana and Pagliacci. I know you'll love these works as much as I do. I'm Nick Ravellis, and I'll see you at the opera.